What's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg, and this is another Chance Encounter. Hey, what's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg. I'm a commercial real estate guy. I'm from the internet. We're seeing uh, we're seeing more properties like this being built in front of a house. Gonna be torn down soon. I understand that there are power lines that are just kind of close. What's up again? This is Dan Fradenberg, and that there is a commercial real estate building. I'm joined today with Cassandra, and is it Hearn? Is that how you pronounce your last name? Cassandra right. Hearn? All right, yeah. excellent. And how are you doing today, Cassandra? I'm doing pretty pretty well. It's snowing today where I'm at, so I'm just kind of bundled up inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a drag, you know, dealing with winters and whatnot. But uh, one thing that warms my heart, I don't know if you know this or not, uh, Cassandra, but today we are joined by my very favorite member of the audience. And why is my favorite audience member here? It's because this is a chance encounter where I interview commercial real estate syndicators, deal sponsors, investors, buyers, sellers, and all that kind of thing. And you may ask yourself, why would you do that? And the answer is, if you've ever heard of an off-market deal, these are private deals that you're not allowed to publicly discuss, you should also know that the SEC requires that you have documentation of your prior substantive relationship or else they'll get ants in their pants and we don't want that. It's a house of cards when they get uh, upset with you. So I have people on here and I find out about what they're focusing on and the benefit to you is that you will learn how to more effectively communicate on the subject of the commercial real estate deal and the teams. But before we get too excited about deals themselves, Cassandra, do you want to say a thing or two about yourself? Um, yeah, so with me, I've been in real estate for two years now. My main focus is multifamily syndications. Um, my main role is investor relations, capital raising, and my team and I focus a lot on AI. We um, implemented AI into every department of our capital company beginning of 2023. And since then, we started another company to educate businesses and real estate investors how to do so themselves. Um, so at the end of 2023, I was involved with teaching 80 real estate investors how to, to do so from branding, websites, um, underwriting, uh, marketing, everything to help them out. And um, I just, I love teaching people how to do that in their businesses today and, and in-person events, master classes and I, I mainly love it because like, um, with me, no one, no one helped me get started. I didn't do a coaching program or have a mentor. I just learned it all myself. So I just want to help people get there faster than I did. Mm -hmm. Wow. That, that's really awesome. And, uh, I'm going to start off with, uh, the motivations, but I got to say, but wait, check your rate. I don't know if you can do this or not, but maybe you can see through the camera and down at the, it might be in the audience's device, this hideous subscribe button down there and they can just, okay. It's a stupid joke, but whatever. The five distinct motivations. Uh, I go through the five distinct motivations in every episode of Chance Encounters because we do have to know what's going to keep uh, these potential partners from throwing in the towel, basically calling it quits when the going gets tough because it's a business after all and that's how it is. And after interviewing hundreds of different syndicators, I found that uh, even though we have our own unique why for, for what motivates us, I found they still fit pretty neatly into these five different categories. And here they are. The first one is preservation of purchasing power. Now, what's that? Well, see, some people, they're job optional. They don't have to have a job. And the reason why they can do that is because of the proceeds of ownership. In other words, they have a portfolio of assets and the profits from those is how they pay their bills. 
And you might think that a person in that situation wouldn't really have any motivation to be buying yet another asset because after all, it takes months to close. It takes years to go full cycle. It's not something that you're really going to want to go through all the time. So why would somebody in this situation do this? Well, there's a couple situations. One is if inflation is rearing its ugly head, well, that's going to eat away from the purchasing power coming from the cash flow. And then the other reason is because there's a, a distress in the property or the business or uh, there's an asset crash, basically meaning that you can buy at a steep discount. Now, of course, everybody should be buying at a steep discount, but uh, basically that's gonna have to be in place for people in this situation to be motivated. And uh, admittedly, I am not to that part in my career yet. So what I'm doing because of my tech background is I am pivoting into getting slivers of deployed capital in return for my effort. And that's because I my background was in tech. And whenever you are a high wage, high salary earner, you're going to wind up paying more in tax than anybody else. So my old boss, starting in 2014, he was flipping 10 houses a month. He was doing 10 transaction house, uh, for single family houses every single month for years before he hired me. And I noticed that he was making money hand over fist and his overall uh, wealth increased way faster than any salary could achieve. So that's why I was like, okay, I need to pivot and figure out how to do that. And so here we are, right? But uh, that's too subtle for a lot of people, especially a lot of youngsters. Uh, generally, when you're young, you want to work like crazy for now and then uh, retire early. Uh, some people, it's not so much about retirement so much as just having more uh, freedom with your schedule to work fewer months per year or fewer weeks per month or something like that. But of course, one thing I should add about uh, a lot of people who have this as their motivation, they think that secretly it's everybody's motivation and people are just in various levels of hiding it. And I assure you that's not the case because some people are motivated purely by ambition. They are going to hustle like crazy because they want that generational wealth. They want to make sure that their great grandchildren never have to hold a day job. And that's why they're going to hustle into their 90s, which is really, really great uh, for every Everybody on the team so so it really you know some people vilify that sort of attitude and I don't think that's fair just like the last group where it's not so much necessarily their own generational wealth that they're trying to build but they've picked a sector of society or maybe it's animals maybe it's the environment uh, who knows what it is but uh, there's a financial component to really having a big impact and that's why some people are making their acquisitions so cassandra of those five different motivations what combination of them would you say describes you best this last one right here help people who need it um for me i've always wanted to be a foster mom and just recently i'm just like i want to be a foster dog mom and just helping people because like like i said before i didn't have any help so i just want to help people get there faster than I did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that answer. And uh, the one thing that is always funny about when we talk about our motivations is there's a little bit of a risk of us sounding too optimistic or naive. And so that's why I like to follow it up with my tolerance for risk assessment question. And I'll tell you where it comes from. If you've ever uh, been involved in a 506B syndication, uh, there's a financial questionnaire that the securities attorney in the mix, and there better have been a securities attorney in the mix or else you should run. Anyway, the, uh, the securities attorney will have insisted that everybody fills out this financial questionnaire. Sometimes it's called a suitability question questionnaire and ask all these invasive questions. But when I was filling one out, I saw the tolerance for risk assessment question and I felt like it lacked utility. It didn't really give me anything I could use as far as information. It didn't tell me more about your actual tolerance for risk. So I made my own one, which is a fill in the blanks question. And it is, there are many popular investment asset classes, but I think blank is too risky. So Cassandra, it can be inside real estate, it can be outside of real estate. What's too risky for you? I think stocks are too risky. Mm -hmm. And I say that because I invested in stocks before COVID happened and I trusted it and then I fell down so low and I just, I 
I don't believe in it unless like you have someone on the inside and that's not legal, but, um, real estate, real estate is where it's at. It's, um, tried and true and trusted. And I definitely believe in real estate, but mm -hmm. not stocks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that because, uh, at the end of the day, all of these publicly traded companies, they have PR branches, like, like a winglets for public relations, which is a group of people whose job is to just spin anything that happens in a way that people will accept. And that's why I like investing directly into these, uh, into these commercial real estate deals is because there is no PR department. You're talking to the person who's making the decisions and, you know, possibly dropping the ball. Right. But uh, that's a little bit of a wet blanket little uh, uh, remark there. But I, I want to get on to this next segment here, which is the favorite deal metrics. And, and, and I want to confess, when I first started doing, I did the first few hundred of these chance encounters, I didn't include this slide because I know, I know that some people, they're more the PR side of things and they're not underwriters as far as you know they love going through every single expense every single line item and then doing their projections off of that that type of uh, underwriter but uh, even if you are more of the front of house you're still going to have a few different metrics that you use to tell the story of of what uh, what the deal is all about whereas the uh, the underwriters themselves will have more of an attitude of what are you talking about all of these are important like you can't really it's like saying which of your children you love the most but not really anyway but for anybody in the audience who is listening and not watching i'm going to read these out uh there's uh, there's 14 of them here and in uh, cassandra you can do like a top three or, or something like that but uh, this is not an exhaustive list there are some other ones that um that some people rely on for very good reason but the ones on the list here are cash on cash irr cost per door noi which is net operating income the going in cap rate which is really talking about the difference between the going rate in that month where this property is located versus what you're buying it at then there's the loan interest rate which is especially important if you're assuming the loan then there's occupancy which is the inverse of vacancy so it's the same number but a different way of looking at it then you have uh, average income where the property is located, the amortization period of the loan, especially if it's going to be assumed, the market versus in place rent. In other words, what's the difference between those two prices? The population growth where the property is located. In other words, that way there's some baked in appreciation from demand. Then there's the sponsor record, which is the number of deals that have gone full cycle and the number of deals that are on the go at any given moment. And then there's the waterfall, the split or the exit strategy. And that's to tell the story of what's going to happen after your capital has been returned. And then there's the DSCR, which is the debt service coverage ratio, which means how much of the revenue from rent is going out the door immediately just to pay for the loan. So Cassandra, uh, what, what are the numbers that you tend to zone in on? Um, I would say the most important things for my team are the cash on cash. And if I was evaluating new people, I would say the sponsor's record, um, because I've seen that come up as a big issue with new syndicators getting into the business is um, I don't trust the sponsors or they've had some negative um, interactions with them over time. So cash on cash, it for us, it just relates a clear picture of like the profitability and efficiency of what we're doing. And that is one of like the most bottom lines that we we go through with our investors. Um, just today, we wrapped up our annual investor calls. I think we had we have eight different portfolios, and we just wrapped them up. Um, that was like the bottom line for investors. They're just like, "What's a cash on cash?" You can go through the whole whole presentation of these are the updates that we did. Here's um, this. Here's what we did with our capex. Here's our NOI, but they bottom line, they just want to know cash on cash. And mm -hmm. we just kind of go through like the few different numbers, one slide, and that's all they want to know. And they're in love with that. So that one's the most important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love it. I'm eating that up like a delicious subscribe <laughs> sandwich. 
It's uh, it's very. I, I uh, yeah, I I like using very subtle ways to get the message uh, across there, and, and it's definitely subtle. But it it tells me it's time to bring out the Dan does deals commercial core competency cube with the six different roles in a commercial real estate deal, and the whole reason why I go through these six different sides in every episode is because more than anything else, it's going to help you not only learn how to more effectively communicate in the subject of commercial real estate deals, but you'll also understand how my guest fits in as well. And the beautiful thing is if you're looking at this cube and going, wow, I need to get me one of those. Well, the good news is it's absolutely free. You can go to dandoesdeals.com and there's this great big button. You just click on it and you download it and you can print it out, show it to your friends and family and all that kind of fun stuff. And I confess I committed the cardinal sin of marketing, which is you should never ever give away your freebie without asking for some sort of contact information. And I don't do that. I don't even ask for your contact information, like your email address, because I want you to click on it and I want you to print it out. And I want to you to practice this because your, your future, your career in commercial real estate is going to hinge on your ability to express yourself and communicate effectively on the subject. So let's do it. So most people, the most visible people in commercial real estate are the repositioners. You're more likely going to run into them than anybody else. And that's because they are the acquisitions people. They're going to be looking at at least a hundred different properties before they find one that's going to make sense. They're going to be doing tons of paperwork to just figure that out. What's that paperwork you may ask? No, you didn't. But anyway, the, the paperwork is called underwriting. You're doing the math. You're doing the arithmetic, figuring out, first of all, is this property even actually making the amount of money that the current seller or broker is claiming it is because okay and so the repositioners they have to be really on the ball and they're looking for upside and one of the most peculiar spots to find upside for a repositioner is why they have a vast network of financiers so they have investor relations they have relationships with different banks and lenders and all that sort of thing and why is that well first of all let's be clear that a financier they're only dealing with paper and money and the owners of the building they're not dealing with the residents or anything like that okay so they're not going to be on a gp team now the reason why you have to have lots and lots of financier friends if you're a repositioner is because if you can secure a more advantageous loan that goes straight to the profitability of the building so that's some upside just baked in so that's why they're talking to financiers really frequently but the repositioners uh, next place to look will be the operations team is to try and stop those benjamins from going down the toilet but of course there's more to operations than just unclogging toilets and collecting rents and mowing lawns or shoveling snow if you're where i am or where cassandra is but uh, the parts that i contribute to operations especially as somebody who's remote based there's a couple. One is the web-based applications, you know, websites and content and all that sort of thing, which uh, that's one thing I contribute. But the bigger one to understand is that in all types of real estate, vacancy is the enemy. So that means even if you're looking at bigger properties like I've tended to in the past, the 100 units and up type of places, uh, then you you if there's a lot of vacancy there, that's what's going to actually kill the deal. So somebody with some marketing chops will need to step in, even if you're outsourcing to a third party property management because it's a, a bigger property. So that's the operations. There's only so much you can do with that. So the next part that the repositioner looks at is the contractor team to upgrade the units to renovate the place make it nicer the idea being that if it's a nicer property the future residents would be happy to pay more in rent than the previous ones and so that is some upside right there but of course if only it were that simple you know you can spend endless amounts of money on contractors you can gold plate the toilets if that's what you really want but there's not going to be any return on investment so somebody has to be able to keep an eye on these contractors making sure that they're not dragging their heels they're getting the projects done in a timely manner and i don't know if you know this about me or not but i'm from the internet so that means i need 
locals. I need boots on the ground, somebody who can be there in an hour or two, because that will not be me. I'd still be stuck at an airport in an hour or two. So I definitely need to have somebody who can keep an eye on the contractors, keep an eye on the operations, and then that makes me a responsible repositioner. But let's say you have aspirations of becoming a repositioner one day. You get this idea in your head of, hey, I know how to buy a house. I put down my down payment, I borrow the rest from the bank, and then suddenly I'm a property owner. Well, if you decide, hey, what if, you know, because I don't know, you're an engineer or a physician or an attorney or something like that, you get the idea that, hey, I bet I could turn around to my circle of friends and everybody pitches in like 100K or something like that, and we could buy that 350 unit apartment complex down the road. So you get the uh, place under contract, you turn around to the financiers, and you say, hey, I want to buy that place for tens of millions of dollars. Do you have... I don't know, say tens of millions of dollars you want to lend us? Well, there's going to be one problem with that question in the financier's mind. And if you're in a mentorship or a guru program, something like that, I encourage you to listen very carefully to this next part because they tend to gloss over this a fair bit. The financiers are going to ask, who's your sponsor? Who's your KP? What's that all about? Well, the banks, they end up lending out money that comes from their depositors. So they have to be very, very careful who they lend to. So if you and your friends in that hypothetical want to take over that 350 unit apartment complex, well, somebody in the fold has to already own a similar asset because you need to be able to prove to the bank you're not just going to run the place into the ground with their depositors money. So you need to involve somebody who's already a sponsor, who already is a, a key principal, one of these KPs. On top of that, you need a certain amount of liquidity. And then for collateral among the GP team, you need a balance sheet of at least the amount of the loan. But if you have all those pieces, you got yourself a commercial real estate deal. So Cassandra, you mentioned uh, your, your financier investor relations part, and then also uh, the underwriting, so the repositioner part, but uh, like, are those the main sides of the die that uh, you focus on, or is there like asset management that uh, you want to mention as well, or? Um, good question. So my team is a sponsor team. Mm -hmm. So we get approached from different coaching programs, students um, to underwrite their deals and sponsor them. Um, so one thing that our superpower is we do underwriting with AI. Um, I know there's all these tools out there that people use, they spend thousands of dollars on, but we kind of have like the secret sauce in-house, um, and underwrite for free instead of spending all that money. Um, 2023, we underwrote over 900 deals and just kind of looking at different things and different, um, aspects of it because we want to be very strategic about what deal we have next um but ai um i do a lot of the business operations so pr marketing capital raising a little bit of everything but underwriting um mm -hmm. so i don't know if that answers your question <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. It definitely does. All right, cool. And so then my next question has to do with uh, uh, the buy box. And so when we're talking about buy boxes, we're really talking about geography, we're talking about size, and we're talking about what's normally called class. So geography, like which states. Size is important because the type of group that will take over, say, a 10-unit apartment complex, they're going to be way different from a group that takes over 150-unit apartment complexes. So that's the importance of size but when you talk about class i think it really should be called desirability and it's split into two different parts the first one is the uh the condition so how old is the building how beat up is the building what about luxuries and amenities and whatnot and then if you're talking about the area especially if you're talking about residential like an apartment complex the school districts are going to be important but then the uh, on the other parts of area is the the crime rate and then of course the amount of traffic that goes by every single day but the desirability the class or the, the area and the condition they rank the same way as grade school so you have a plus then a then a minus then b plus and so on so cassandra as far as your sponsorship group, group goes uh what's uh what's the buy box so right now we're in five different states we're in texas louisiana missouri kentucky and mississippi 
Um, we do have a criteria of different states along the Sun Belt, but um, this year we were like, you know what, we're going to keep that open to any state and we're going to see what deal just makes sense first of all. Uh, we mostly buy multifamily, 80 units and above, garden style, built 1980s and, and after, no crime on the property within the last five years. Um, and then we just, we underwrite from there. We kind of keep an open mind as far as the states, because we get people approaching us so often. We'll say, hey, let's look at the numbers first and see if they make sense. And then go in and do our due diligence and market research from there. Um, but I think, I think it's important to just keep an open mind about the states. I know people, newer people that just get started in real estate, a lot of them say, well, I just got to narrow down my market. Mm -hmm. And then I got to figure out the underwriting and then I have to find a sponsor and then I have to start marketing myself and, and going from there. But I think you, it's important to do everything all at once, but keep an open mind about the different markets. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that kind of sets us apart is um, we have sourced broker information from every state. We've kind of like to scrape different information from websites and pull in that information just to nurture those relationships first. Um, so when we want to go into a different market and say, hey, we're not in, let's say, um, we're not in Florida, but we've nurtured those relationships with those brokers and we've, we've had them on our email list for so long and they've interacted with us and they like us. Now we have a property in Florida now that relationship goes a little bit better and that that deal goes a little bit better because they already know us. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I think it's important just to keep an open mind when you're looking for properties. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. And so then uh, the next question that everybody has to be asking is how do you reach out? I'm going to sandbag that and talk about myself first. I got uh, this unique, uh, it's not unique, it's just distinctive last name. So it makes it really easy to find me, especially on LinkedIn, which is the social media platform where I spend most of my time. Of course, if you hop on Amazon.com, I've also got uh, books on several different business skill related uh, fields, including real estate. But if you are going to be getting involved into syndications, into this, these types of investments, I highly encourage you, even if you have to pause the video, to scan this QR code that's right here, because that brings you to the FAQs page of 506 Beamy, which is the platform where I offer the IT services of uh, maintaining your documentation or your substantive relations. So the idea being, if you drop your laptop into the bathtub, you might lose all of your documentation that the SEC is going to want to see if you ever get audited. So I'd make sure that that's all backed up so that you just can get that out of mind. But uh, Cassandra, if people want to reach out to you, uh, email, phone, website, social media, what are, what are the best ways to reach out? Um, you can reach out on LinkedIn. My first name is Cassandra, last name H-E-R-N, Hearn. Um, I'm also very active on um, Instagram, so you can follow me on Instagram. It's Cass Hearn. It's four S's, so C-A-S-S-S-S, -S -S -S, Hearn, H-E-R-N, um, or email me. Um, actually, don't email me. Just follow me on social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Good stuff. So then that only brings me to the last part, which is the public service announcement, which is if you've been watching this episode and experiencing like searing pains in your eyeballs and like migraine like symptoms, I'm confident it's because of the downright hideous subscribe button. That's right down there. You can just get rid of it for free. And full disclosure, the reason I want people to click on it is because if enough people do, then YouTube will actually start to pay for these videos instead of me. And I think that would be amazing. And uh, the trade-off to you, just full disclosure again, is that uh, my videos may show up on your list of suggestions. There's totally no guarantee about that at all. But quite frankly, you can ignore all those suggestions. I just appreciate the fact that you spent this time with me. Just like Cassandra, I appreciate you joining me today. This has been great. Thank you so much, Dan. I really appreciate being here. Awesome. Thanks. Hey there, are you interested in commercial real estate deals? Would you like to build your network of investors and deal sponsors? Well, the best thing I can do for you is have you appear on a chance encounter interview as featured on DanDoesDeals.com. 
You may know me from 506 BME or as a top commercial real estate voice on LinkedIn. And if I had to think of the top factors in your success in commercial real estate, my top two would be your network and your ability to effectively explain how deals work with effective communication. The 15 minute chance encounter format, it checks both of those boxes and they ensure that you can share your private deals with me without the SEC calling it a public solicitation. So hop onto LinkedIn. You can see my name is over here, Dan Freidenberg, and search for my name. And the, the best way to reach me and book that is to message me through LinkedIn. And don't worry, it doesn't matter if you decided to enter this space just last week or two weeks ago, or if it was decades ago, it'll be fun and easy to look good. We're just asking multiple choice questions based on your core competencies you look to contribute, your level of sophistication, all that kind of stuff. So I hope to hear from you soon. Thanks a lot. Bye. Make sure you 506 B me. Any syndicators, make sure you 506 B me. Hi. Oh, hey, yeah, here's my code. You got your QR code scanner. Okay, yeah, oh yeah, just hold it right in the square there. Okay, cool, and now you hit open in browser. Okay. Okay, are you already logged into 506 B me? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so there's my video. So now I'm already on your watch list. So when you get back to your hotel, you can find out what my core competencies are and my level of sophistication. Sound good? Yeah. I love your hat. Real estate's a scam. That's really funny. Yeah, that's funny. Nice meeting you. You too. 506 B me, everybody.